Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Manns, and I'd like to welcome you to the April 4th Coalition Show. This is the October 17th, 2022 edition of the show and is week 424 since the closing of the North Adams Regional Hospital. The April 4th Coalition's mission statement is we are for workers' rights and collective bargaining rights and are against tax breaks for the rich and corporations who ship our jobs overseas. We support all the articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but as is the custom on this show, we put the emphasis on Article 23. So, Dick, you want one and two? Yes, that's all right. Article oh, yeah. 23, Section 1. Everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work, and protection against unemployment. Number two, everyone without any discrimination, has the right to equal pay for equal work. Number three, everyone who works has the right to just and favorable remuneration showing for himself or herself and his or her family an existence worthy of human dignity and supplemented, if necessary, by other means of social protection. Number four, everyone has the right to form enjoy trade unions for the protection of her or his interests. Thank you. And I have to thank Dick for soloing the Columbus Day holiday show as Indigenous I was unavailable. Indigenous Day, yeah. Yeah. Or uh, Indigenous People Day as yes. it, it's it is now. It's twice on the calendar that way, but it was very enlightening. But we were talking about um, human rights mm -hmm. just a few minutes ago, and there's a big issue that's happening internationally. And I thought we'd start the show off with that. Um, and it's, it's, first of all, there's an editorial in the Washington Post that ran on the 13th of October. And it was an opinion from David Ignatius, who is, uh, is an expert in foreign policy. And it, he has the ear of people high up in the Pentagon and the, 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 US. the Department of State. But his opinion says the Iranian regime has never faced a movement like this one. It says, while the world is paying homage to the bravery of Ukraine, let's give a salute as well to the women-led protest movement in Iran that is rattling the clerical government there. This uprising is a stunner. It deserves active American and global support. And that's why I thought we should do it, to provide some global support. It, because they're teaching us too. Yes, I know all the reasons the movement might wither. That's what happened with the mass Iranian protest in 2009, 2017, and 2019. The regime's machinery of repression eventually cracked the code and dismantled the leadership of the protests. And one by one, those brave movements for change retreated. But this but the past is an imperfect guide for today's events. There are reasons even the most skeptical Iran, Iran watchers think this time might be different. The movement involves young people, mostly women, who are outraged at the murder last month of 22-year-old Masha Amin. Their protests appear spontaneous and leaderless, which means there's no infrastructure for the Iranian goon squads to crack down on. For a flavor of this movement, consider the words of a song called Bayre by the Iranian pop singer Shiva Harpura, who was in prison soon after the release. Because of dancing in the street, because of every time we're afraid to kiss our lovers, because of my sister, your sister, our sister, because changing the rotten minds because of the embarrassment of the empty pocket, because of the yearning for normal life. The movement is broadly dispersed with protests in 105 cities in all of Iran's 31 provinces. According to a calculation posted by this week by human rights activist news agency, it's ethnically diverse with thousands of Shiite Persians rallying to support the cause of Amini, a Sunni Kurd. Finally, and the most important, there are early signs that the movement is jumping from students on the streets into the machinery that runs Iran. 
petrochemical workers, truck drivers, merchants in the bazaar. There's a sense of the spread. Oil and petrochemical workers in, in, in the Bashir province, Iban and the provinces have joined the protest. According to the report this week, the Executive Director Center for Human Rights uh, reported that since Amin's death a month ago, more than 200 protesters have been killed, 5,500 5, arrested, and 324, at 324 gatherings. The group has correlated 698 videos showing the demonstrator, demonstrators. The regime is trying to minimize this movement, but the numbers say otherwise. There's a final reason I would pay attention to this movement, which is the simple slogan, women, life, freedom. Mm -hmm. Change is in the air these days. The laws of gravity are being reversed. Tiny Ukraine is taunting the Russian bear on the battlefield. Israel, Israeli, Israelis and Arabs are racing to do business under the banner of the Abraham Accords, which reflect a deeper break from with the past. And Saudi Arabia has all it, and it's all its horrible misdeeds under the crown prince Mohammed Salman is taking surprising steps towards women's rights and social liberation. For aging clerics who, who run Iran, change is poison. It's strange that the Ayatollah Khomeini would choose to draw a red line on the regime's survival at the insistence that women, even very young ones, fully cover their hair. But that's precisely what he's done. You could write a book about it. I think I better stop there, and maybe we okay, should so just look at the You want to show the, vid the videos video. now? Yeah, I'm sorry if I went on too long with that. Oh, it's a powerful editorial. I read it. Salam, guys! With a cheerful salam or hello, Serena Ismail Zadeh welcomed people into what she called my whole universe, the video diaries of a 16-year-old. She could be any teenage girl anywhere in the world. Goofing around, dancing, singing, just having fun. But this isn't anywhere in the world. This is the Islamic Republic of where life's expressions are anything but free. Three months after that video, Serena joined the thousands of Iranian women and girls rising up for their liberties, demanding their rights. Serena was forever silenced on September 23rd. Amnesty International says based on information it has, security forces beat her, striking her on the head with batons, severely beating her to death. <laughs> Iranian judicial authorities denied she was killed. They say Serena died by suicide, jumping from the roof of her grandmother's home. Their claim just days after they said another 16-year-old protester, Nika Shahkarami, who was found dead in Tehran, also died after falling from a building. Arrests have been made in the investigation of her death. Family members of both girls have appeared on Iranian state media, repeating the government's claim. The UN Human Rights Office told CNN they received reports authorities forced Shakarami's family to give the interview. Amnesty International says families of victims are being intimidated and harassed into silence. This comes three weeks after the death of Masa Jina Amini while in the custody of the so-called morality police. On Friday, the government's forensic report blamed the death of the 22-year-old on an underlying medical condition after the operation of a brain tumor as a child. Amini's family repeatedly denied those claims. They say she was healthy. It was police brutality that killed her. They say doctors told them she suffered trauma to the head. <laughs> Anger over Amini's death sparked a women's uprising like no other in Iran. Too many lives already lost in this battle for freedom, for change. <laughs> Too many young lives ended too soon. Jemana Karachi, CNN, Istanbul.
it's very touching when I see that younger sister. Yes, right there by her. Looking at her. Yeah. I wonder how she is right now. And now we have one from the BBC that was made last week, I believe. Okay. Um, we're going to show that one too. By now, most of you have heard the name Masa Amini. Masa. Sheena Amini. Masa Amini. A 22-year-old. 22-year-old Iranian Kurdish woman. Who was arrested and detained by the Iranian morality police. Her crime? Her crime? Improper head job. While in custody, she was dealt so many blows to her head that she fell into a coma and died two days later. <laughs> Since then, the people of Iran have poured into the streets demanding justice for Massa. Justice for Massa. Demanding justice for Massa. Women, life, freedom. The words chanted by Kurdish protesters after the death of Mahsa Jina Amini, no one could imagine the slogan shouted that day would so quickly spread across Iran and far beyond its borders. Uh, so following the death of Mahsa Jina, uh, it suddenly gave people some courage, right? That, that kind of demonstration, that demonstration of solidarity, it gave women courage. And I think that that was a, that was a very kind of turning point in, in the feminist movement in Iran. The first time I heard people across uh, Iran in different universities, people in the street, women in the street, uh, chanting, Zhenjian uh, Azadi, woman, life, freedom, or liberty, I was filled with Excitement. I actually was feeling like that I'm living uh, through a miracle. Soon after, university students and high school girls chanted the phrase while confronting the Islamic Republic security forces. Where did the slogan begin? The origins of the slogan Jinjian Azadi that we've been hearing echoing all around the world is rooted in the Kurdish women's freedom movement. It also represents the universal experience of Kurdish people in all four, four parts of Kurdistan, whether that's Turkey, Syria, Iran or Iraq, in the struggle for Kurdish recognition. We saw this being chanted in Syria against uh, Daesh, the so-called Islamic State, and against uh, Turkish invasions of northern Syria. And now we be, we're seeing this chanted on the streets of Iran, particularly in the Kurdish areas, by Kurdish women. And this is no excuse, this is no coincidence. Since the Islamic Revolution in 1979, Iranian women have been fighting against compulsory hijab. Six years ago, a group of women in the streets of Tehran removed their headscarves in protest, an act punishable by law. One of them was Azam Jangravi. The Iranian government pressured me and my family. They threatened to remove my daughter from my custody. I was given a three-year prison sentence. While on bail, Azam fled Iran and now lives in Toronto, Canada, where she has joined the protests in support of Iranian women. When I see those moments when a woman confronts a police officer, a woman standing up to demand her rights, like I stood up to demand my rights, I can say it's the most beautiful moment. It gives me hope that the next generation won't live like us. They will get their rights. Since the beginning of the unrest, women and men across Iran together chant women, life, freedom. This is the first time protests have been led by women and supported by men. Their slogan has given hope to so many Iranians that this time around the protest might topple the regime or force the regime to change its policies. I mean, the courage it takes in a place like Iran is uh, is always inspiring because that th that there is no guardrails in right. Iran. It, it, you stand up 
you're going to get tortured. You're going to get beaten. You're, you could die very easily. It's all in the hands. And yes, finally, some fathers, some brothers some are joining in. Right. Which is, and even, which even some of the workers in different... In different Because plants. they are their, their daughters or their... Their sisters. Or, or their mothers. Or their mothers. And yeah. to think, yeah. you know. Property of no one. That was and what, ju just remember when you start hearing morality police, think Christian right in the United States. Yes. Yes. I have nothing against Christianity in and of itself because I'm Catholic, but the Christian right in the U.S. has the same goals, same ideas. Just you know, women, my way or the highway. Life, freedom. Remember, that reminds me of Sojourner Truth when she went to this. She considered herself a minister. She was a freed mm -hmm. slave, and she took on the name Joseph, so Sojourner Truth, and she was at this convention. I think it wasn't far away from here. It might have been in Northampton. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But there were all these ministers around, and uh, she got up to speak, and they said, no, women aren't allowed to speak. And, and she, she says, ain't I a woman? She said, listen, you know, um, that Jesus that you worshiped was born... Of, 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 of a, born of, of a, a woman, woman and God. A man didn't have nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, yep. you know, it's just, it, 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 you know, as David Ignatius encouraged us to raise our consciousness of what they're going through mm -hmm. in Iran and, and, and all throughout the, the Middle East, what women are going through, and then also reflect on how women are being treated in this country. And because wh the what direction is, are we going? We, we're going backwards at right. this point. We're at a point, they said, this is the first time that we always saw that, that you know, going towards a more perfect union, union, that we always were going forward, bringing more freedom to all the members of, of the, the society. society. And this Dobbs decision that occurred this year is the first time it's taking Taken. rights away. Yes, it is. We're going backwards. Going backwards. At least in terms of individuals, it's the yes. first time. To be honest, I, I always take this in United as the first time. Yes. We went backwards because they yes. decided, in this case, they decided to give a human right to a corporation, which was kind of yeah. unusual to a political movement and stuff. And on the docket, it, you can almost feel the LBGQT rights that were just recently given are going to be going down or restricted very soon. And instead of just, even if the Supreme Court just punts it and says they leave it up to the states, it's just, that that is like cowardice to just say yeah. it that way. If you believe, then do it, but have the guts to do it yourself. <laughs> don't, yeah. don't pass it to the legislatures. Yeah, well, speaking of that, we have a really important election coming up. Mm -hmm. um, Early voting starts on the 22nd. What's today? The 17th? Today's the 17th. 17th. So on the 22nd. Ba ballots, be, ballots have started arriving at MCLA yeah. from other Vote early. Communities. You, know, it's, you can vote early from 1022 to 114. Mm -hmm. And you can vote by mail. You can apply as far as till November 1st. Correct. And uh, you can vote on election day, figure out where you have to vote. That's on November 8th. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to do some more talking about this, but I thought we'd just go into like the AFL-CIO. And what they, uh, what who they endorse this year? Right, and the Massachusetts AFL-CIO website, it says Massachusetts AFL-CIO political program helps to elect candidates who believe the working people of Massachusetts should share in the prosperity of the Commonwealth. This requires identifying candidates who will protect rights invest in infrastructure, and defend government as, an essential, as essential to the public good. Our efforts are led by the Committee on Political Education, which includes the executive officers, the executive council, and our political and legislative director. The COOP mobilizes the educa and educates union members to vote for candidates who reflect our values of shared prosperity and workers' rights. You want me to go on to the yes. COPE program? Yeah. The COPE committee uses strict criteria to endorse and help elect the candidates for the state legislature. Statewide constitutional offices, the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate, the COPE committee also endorses ballot issues. Other factors are considered, 
include whether a candidate has introduced or testified on behalf of key legislation, whether they have made remarks supportive of unions and working people during floor debates, and whether they have participated in pro-union and working family activities, such as walking picket lines or writing letters of support. Candidates running for county or municipal office are not considered by the state COPE and must seek endorsement through the central labor councils, which have the jurisdiction over local and county races. Um, and if Dave can bring it up on the TV show, for the constitutional offices, they endorsed Maura Healy for a governor, Mayor Kim Driscoll for a lieutenant governor, Andrea Campbell for attorney general, Senator Diane DiZoglio for auditor, Secretary Bill Galvin for Secretary of State, and Treasurer Deb Goldberg. On to the U.S. House, in our area for first congressional, which is ours, they endorsed the chair, Richard Neal, who has been there in the, is. there he is on the upper right, if you're looking at it from a TV point of view. If you're looking at it the way we are, he's on the upper left. Yeah. And we have a good friend in, in our neighboring congressman, uh, Chair uh, Jim, Jim McGovern. McGovern. Yes, he's always been very popular yeah. in that area. And let's see, for endorsements for the Massachusetts House, or do you want to do the Senate? Senate, the Senate. Senate. Okay, I'll flip the camera. For the Senate, uh, for ours, for Berkshire Hamden, here, it, here it comes. Here it is, yes. Right, is, is they've endorsed Paul Mark. He's been endorsed by the IBEW for Berkshire Hampton, Franklin, Hampshire County because that's his whole entire area. And he is in the center left position and on the far left in the, in the center row. I think that IBEW connotates that he is a member of the that union. Yes, he, he was. He worked, he, he worked for the uh, telephone company and he worked his way up from working out on the street and at nights he went to school, he went to law school mm -hmm. and he was very active in his union and then he decided to run as a state representative and then the entire Berkshire delegation chose him. They encouraged him, him to run. To run. And, uh, and, and usually that's what happens, you know, you, you start as a house in the house and you move, you move up, up to, to the, the Senate, Senate, to right. a, the higher house. Um, and he was, an, he, he was unanimously pushed. Like no one's running against him Still, from, that, is, from that group. Which know. is nice, yes. yes. You know, and uh, for well, the House. Massachusetts house, house, we have a list of candidates and um, we can see right there that They've listed John Barrett as the first Berkshire representative. representative. So he has their endorsement. Yep, and he's running un unopposed. And for the South County. No, no, there is someone running against him. There in is... the Republican Party? No, oh, I'm not sure. No, that, he, he that, was in the, that was in the primary. That was in the primary, because the last I heard, he's, he's uncontested for that one. And uh, for the third Berkshire, it's Mitty Pignatelli, and I'm looking for Tricia, but I don't see her. Gorman, which should be the second Berkshire. Uh, Bouvier. Tricia Farley Bouvier. I don't see her. Anywhere, so maybe she's There's running. Smitty Pignatelli there. Mm -hmm. I didn't see Tricia, but I'm fairly positive they would have endorsed her at this point in time. Yeah. I think so. And then we'll spend some time later on the ballot questions. Yes, um, there's four, I believe, this year. At least four. And, and, oh, and one thing that it says here is that um, these are the to-date endorsements. To-date. Okay, you know, so, yeah. they, so probably, they, yeah. they, they still have time. They still have three weeks to yeah. update their, their list on that. You know, so it also has a section here. It says... Once selected, the Massachusetts AFL-CIO supports endorsed candidates or ballot issues by educating union members via targeted communications, highlighting how these candidates and issues will help working people share in the prosperity of Massachusetts and enhance the common good. Political education programs operate year-round, including compiling and reviewing voting records for all state legislatures in the state congressional delegation. Our efforts ramp up during campaigns when we produce campaign literature, fact sheets, web pages, 
and other research-based materials to let members know the issues at hand. Our thousands of union activists get out Labor's vote through member-to-member -member communications, including phone banks, canvassing, rallies, mail, emails, social media, and one-on-one -on -one conversations at the job site. And then that last paragraph, I don't know if you have about union member yeah, candidate I have it. school. Support, all right, there's also a union member candidate school. Support for union members running for elected office is top priority for the Massachusetts AFL-CIO and our affiliates. We know that when our members run on a platform of working people's values and receive unipi unified support for the labor movement, we will win. Massachusetts AFL-CIO and, and its executive board are establishing a union candidate, candidate school to train our members to run for elected office from the local municipal level all the way up to statewide federal office. And then they just give us the, the candidate school and, and sign up for our weekly newsletter. So, yeah. But if you want to run for office or thought about it, there's no need. I mean, if you're a union member, you should take advantage of this and, and, and go to this candidate school. It helps and, you get your feet wet. Right. And there's also a website. It's called Run for Something. And there are people that will come and they'll help you. They'll, they'll interview you, talk to you, and then they'll provide the support that you need to get elected. And they're not just talking about you know, national or state. The, they're talking the about local, local elections. Level. Because we have to rebuild this democracy. It's been under attack. We right. have like 70% or something like that of the, peop the Republican, members of the Republican Party believed that the election was stolen in that in 2020. 20. And, Only, they're, and they're already laying the groundwork to yeah. say it's going to be stolen in 2022 if any of their candidates lose. Right. And they're following the playbook of, like we talked about uh, in, in past shows, about you know, establishing tyranny mm -hmm. you know, and establishing you know, anti-democratic forces within the society. Right. And so we advocate for unions. We advocate for democracy at the grassroots level. Yes, we do, and we're going to have to build it from the ground up again. And you got to vote, you know, like that theme song to Ralph Nader says, "Stand up and fight." We've been sitting for way too long, mm -hmm. you know. We have We've to stand up. We've been comfortable. Up. Yeah. So we haven't felt it until recently. So we have to get out and vote. Get your friends and neighbors and, and your family members to get out and vote, and vote for those candidates that have been endorsed by the AFL-CIO because they work for working families. And they do. And as Mike says, the power is with the people. And that's you folks. Yeah. So get if out and vote. If you want it, so endorse and fight. And do what you can to support the women around the world that are fighting Action. for their freedom. Yes. So women, life, freedom. Freedom. Have a good evening. There's power in a five tree. Cheese.